So welcome everybody. My name again is Cara Fernandez and very excited to talk about some winter waterfowl today. Um, but at the refuge, we have some really great upcoming events. Uh, we have a light the night coming up at the end of January. So you can check our website for more information. And we, you can also become a member of the refuge. If you become a member in January, you will have your membership benefits through the whole year. Um, some of those include free and discounted programs, free use of cross country skis. So there's a lot of really great things. Um, if you are interested in, in becoming a member, we have that on our website as well. But um, the refuge is a great place to look for waterfowl because it started off as a waterfowl sanctuary in the 1930s. So in today's program, we're going to talk a lot about winter waterfowl birds that migrate here and spend the winter on Long Island, um, as well as the history of the refuge the adaptations and behaviors of ducks and geese that we see in the winter and the types that we have, especially at the refuge, but also covering some of the other bodies of water that are prevalent on Long Island. And then also conservation of these really special animals. So the refuge um, has a really unique history. In the early 1900s, uh, the refuge was actually not a wildlife refuge. It was called the Quag Ice Cream operated on Quanta Creek, and then they came up here to the main property of the refuge on this body of fresh water that got its name from the ice company. So now it's called Old Ice Pond. So you'll probably hear me say Old Ice Pond um, often throughout the program. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the group chat. Um, we can also save questions for the end if you'd rather ask them out loud. But um, this is a photo of the, the building on the left was the ice house that was at Quanta Creek. And then when a dam was removed at Montauk Highway, there was saltwater intrusion. And of course, ice is not very good if there's salt water in it. So they had to move their location. They came to um, the freshwater pond, which is where the main site of the refuge is, and it was the Quag Ice Company. So from 1913 to the Quag Ice Company operated here at what is now the Quag Wildlife Refuge. And this is a mural of uh, what it looked like on the main site of the Quag Ice Company in the year around 1913. So this is relevant because um, after refrigeration was invented, there was this body of fresh water that was being utilized by a lot of wildlife and it became really important habitat for ducks and geese. Um, it is fresh water and it's fairly shallow. So it's a great sheltering spot for these animals. And um, in the 1930s, there was a, a couple of reasons why the refuge got started here. And across the country, there was this surge in interest in preserving waterfowl and duck populations because they were being overhunted. There was rapid settlement on Long Island, but also across North America. Um, commercial duck raisers were sometimes um, dredging bodies of water and taking the food to feed the ducks that they were raising, but wild ducks were having a hard time eating. But then there was also a really severe winter in the year of 1933 to 1934. And that's when the Quag Wildlife Refuge got started. So there was a group of duck hunters that are sometimes called water fowlers. But they noticed that the local population of ducks and geese were declining rapidly. Um, in that year, in 1933, the, there were lows up to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's really cold. We thought today was cold here, right? It's around 15 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees. It was negative 22 for a long period of time in 1933. So all of the ducks and geese that migrate from Canada and come spend the winter here because it's warmer, were having a really hard time finding food and they were dying in large um, flocks. So these, this group of conservationists, and some of their pictures are on the screen here, um, they decided to break the ice at this site, at the Quag Ice Company site, use the pond, and feed the flocks. So they ended up feeding 30 tons of grain potato mixture to help the, the wild ducks um, population come back on Long Island. They also banned the ducks and had a scientific research permit. And um, ever since then, ever since that time, the refuge has been a wildlife preserve. 
And in 1934, the Southampton Township Wildfowl Association, which is the Quag Wildlife Refuge, was established uh, with 45 charter members. But in 1936, the trophy that you see on your screen, they won first prize in the National Wildlife Refuge Contest. And it, this was a pretty big deal back then because this was the start of national wildlife refuges across the country. So um, this the STWA won first prize. The contest was actually judged by um, Jay Norwood Ding. He's also known as Ding Darling. Um, he was the first director of the National Wildlife Federations, the founder of that. Um, so it was a really big deal and something that we're very proud to discuss now at the refuge. The contest was actually sponsored by more game birds in America, which was the forerunner for Ducks Unlimited. So I'm sure you, you all have seen the, you know, the stickers that you see or waterfowlers and hunters. Um, Duck, Ducks Unlimited is a big nationwide organization that does a lot of conservation work too. So the logo of the refuge is actually American black ducks. So we love seeing American black ducks here. They're a shy bird, but we see lots of them in the winter time because they are migratory. And this was, our logo was painted by Roland Clark, who was a famous waterfowl artist. And he also designed the 1938 federal duck stamp which is really interesting. So here's a picture of Roland Clark and one of the charter members, Charlie Belt, uh, in um, East Quag at the, and Pine Neck in 1936. So we're gonna jump right into learning about the different species of birds that we'll see at the refuge, but also across Long Island. And we're so lucky to have bays the ocean, the sound, and freshwater ponds here. So it attracts a lot of waterfowl because, again, they all need water to feed. And some of them are prefer different habitats, of course. So we're going to learn all about where to look for certain birds, which ones are the most common, and some field IDs to help us identify them. But the birds are, um, in the family Anna today, there are 60 species of waterfowl in North America. Uh, we see 50 species in Eastern North America, but this family includes swans, geese, ducks, teals, and mergansers. All have webbed or lobed feet, and most species, some of them exhibit sexual dimorphism, which means that the males look different than the females. So um, when you think about identifying these birds when you're out there at, in a preserve or here at the refuge, uh, sometimes you have to learn what a hundred different birds look like because we'll see 50 species in North America and sometimes the males look different than the females. But not to worry, it's a lot of fun and there are some amazing adaptations that this family has. So um, in your head, can you think of the heaviest waterfowl, the lightest, um, the best diver, the longest whistle, and We'll go right into it. The heaviest is the trumpeter swan, which can be up to 35 pounds. The lightest is the female green wing teal, which is only six ounces. So these are some amazing diversity in the family. Um, the best diver is the long-tailed duck. They can dive up to 240 feet. The longest whistle when some of the some of these um, ducks fly, you can hear their the noise as their wings are flying and that's the whistle but the common golden eye you can hear the whistle of their wings a half a mile away and um, for the ruddy duck they're they can um, they have the largest eggs compared to their body size and their clutch of eggs can lay more than the fem way more than the female and then a lot of these birds can see around their head up to 340 degrees and that allows them to see any predators that are about. Um, some predators for most of these animals are raccoons, fox, birds of prey like great horned owls, um, red-tailed hawks, eagles. So by being able to see around them, they can uh, escape from predators more easily. 
So some tips for observing waterfowl is, um, especially in the beginning of the year, you wanna pay attention to where you are in terms of habitat. Is it shallow water? Is it deep water? Is it fresh or is it salt? That can help you determine the type of bird that you'll be seeing, but also the weather that you see on Long Island or up north. So if you are really serious about seeing waterfowl, if you pay attention to when cold weather rolls in in Canada and where the birds are spending their breeding um, season, if it gets really cold and the bodies of water there freeze, uh, they'll start to migrate or be pushed lower. And that's when we'll start to see a lot of waterfowl. And um, field IDs can be really important to know. And one of them for waterfowl is just to, if it can be distracting to look at all parts of the bird, but if you just look for where you see the white on a bird, that can give you hints about what species it is. So for instance, the gadwalls that we were looking at um, before in the video, they have a white wing patch and other waterfowl, they don't have that. So then you know right away that it was a gadwall. Um, and I like to bring binoculars or a spotting scope with you everywhere because you'll start to see birds everywhere you go. And the one time that you'll see something really special is when you don't have them. So uh, make sure you bring your binoculars everywhere you go. And if you look at your field guide, um, I, I think it's really important to have just an Eastern bird field guide. That way you don't get distracted by birds that are most likely not here. They're, they're spending their time on the west coast um, birds that you know you won't see here unless it's accidental so I think an eastern field guide is really important and some terms to to know that might come up in your field guide um, are drake that's the male bird a hen is the female and eclipse plumage is referring to their non-breeding plumage, which is actually how we're going to see the birds because it's not the breeding season. So some of the birds that we might see will have their eclipse plumage. Usually it's um, drabber or it's not as bright because they're not attracting a mate yet. Um, the primary feathers are located on the left-hand side. You can see here on the wing and the secondaries and the speculum can be really important, especially in ducks. So the speculum there. So um, another adaptation that ducks have, but also seagulls like in this picture and um, penguins have is counter current heat exchange. A lot of people wonder how these birds can swim in freezing water, stand on ice or stand on snow. Um, and it's because of how the arteries pass the, ve the veins. So you can see in this diagram that the artery, the warm arterial blood is very close to the cold venous blood because it's so close, it limits the loss of heat. So their, their feet are staying fairly cold, but not cold enough to get frostbite. Um, it, on a 32 degree day, a mallard duck only loses around 5% of their body heat from their legs. So countercurrent heat exchange is really important for these birds that are out in the cold weather. And um, it's very important not to feed any animals, but especially not to feed ducks and geese bread. Um, bread actually fills them up and the nutrition is not good for them. So it can make them have what's called angel wing or their wings will grow out um, perpendicular to their body. They can't fly. So it is really important not to feed bread um, to any animals, but especially ducks and geese, because these guys can find all of their own food in the water. Some of them eat aquatic vegetation. Some of them eat invertebrates or fish. So very important not to, to feed them. And then right now you might be seeing birds starting to pair up um, and find a mate. So some things that we can look for in this video we'll, we'll play um, from Cornell Lab is you might see them bobbing their head. So this is, we see this a lot at the refuge, the mallards are starting to pair up and they'll be head bobbing. So this is some courtship behavior and most ducks and geese are um, monogamous. So that means they make they can make a lifelong pair or find a lifelong mate. They also, um, some species will just pair every year. They'll make a, a year long bond and their courtship might last in the fall. Some can last for four to eight months. 
But the dabbling ducks, which are the ones that just duck down to eat food, they usually pair before the diver. So this is a diving duck. This is a common golden eye. But these are some fun behaviors to look for. And now you know what they're doing. So they're trying to find a mate. And 75% of mallards and black ducks and gadwalls will be paired up by November. So the, the four ducks that we saw at the beginning of the, the program, those are pairs that will last until the spring. And we're seeing ducks that are coming from Canada and our flyway, the Atlantic flyway, um, are the, the little icons in green. So you can see that some of the ducks that are coming that spend the winter here on Long Island have made a really long trip already. So they might be coming from Canada, Maine, or extending their migration through Florida and the Caribbean. So the, the northern pintail, which is at the bottom of the screen, um, they make the longest migration. They uh, will usually start earliest too because they prefer shallow wetlands that freeze earlier. So they migrate first. Um, they usually will um, be driven by weather, but also by day length. So we know that the, the days get shorter as we go through the winter and that will drive migration. One note that I, I wanted to share was um, the central flyway and some of the Atlantic flyway is really affected by this, um, the prairie pothole region, which is up near Canada and in the mid of the United States. And it's sometimes referred to as um, the duck factory of America because it's the, the most important habitat for waterfowl. You can see every little pothole here of fresh water and water is perfect breeding ground for most of North America's waterfowl. So conservation of that region is really important. Um, 50 to 90% of the potholes have been lost or severely damaged, but um, a very important region for conservation. And here at the refuge, um, it's a great spot a sheltered spot for ducks and geese to feed and to rest. The islands that are out on the pond are actually man-made and they were made just for ducks and geese to nest. So all of those islands are good spots to look with your binoculars because we'll see a lot of ducks go up into the, the reeds um, or not the reeds, but into the, um, the water willow and they'll rest there. Um, but the pond is fairly shallow. It's around six to 10 feet. Uh, deep at all points and um, it's it's nice and protected as I was saying before so if there's really stormy weather on the the bays and the ocean sometimes we'll see a lot more ducks um, will come here during the winter for protection so the three most common species that we see here are Canada geese I hope everyone has seen a Canada goose before and then mallard ducks and American black ducks so if you come on any day during the winter you should see all three of these birds. Um, so those are the, the most common. And jumping right into it, Canada geese are actually really amazing birds. I think we take them for granted on Long Island because we see them all the time. But in the 1940s and 1950s, they weren't as common to see on Long Island. So parts of the refuge were actually created. Um, there was one part of the refuge that was cleared and in the 1950s was planted with green to attract Canada geese. So people wanted them here. Um, they are really, really beautiful birds and uh, it's great to see them. Of course, they'll be here year round. So they don't necessarily just come here for the winter, um, but we'll also see them breeding and this is a picture that was taken in late April on the pond. So these are some little ducklings that were born uh, or goslings rather. And the dabbling ducks are in the family anise or the genus anise. Um, so they will tip up and feed, but they don't really dive underwater. So this can help you um, if you don't know what species it is and you just see them dabbling it's a dabbling duck, right? It's not a diving duck. So that can help you determine what species it is. But um, there are 31 species in the genus Anis. And mallard ducks are the most common. They are found in almost any wetland habitat in suburban, in urban areas. There are 11.6 million breeding birds. And this is a, a video that was taken last week here at the refuge of some mallard ducks 
ice skating. But mallard ducks, because they're so common, are perfect to compare other ducks to. So if you see a duck that you don't know what it is, you can kind of think in your brain, um, you know, is it bigger? Is it smaller than a mallard duck? Is it, are its colors similar? And the American black duck uh, does look fairly similar to the mallard duck, especially to the hen mallard duck. But uh, on your left, the American black duck, this is a female and the male has a, a yellowish beak. These are more shy ducks than the mallard ducks. So when we see them here at the refuge, they're usually farther away. They'll sometimes sit on the ice if there's ice on the pond far away from the nature center. Um, this is the the duck of the refuge. This is our logo. Um, and they're really prized ducks in terms of waterfowl hunters too. So this was the main species that was focused on when the refuge got started in terms of conservation. Um, and their population had declined drastically, but also declined through the 1970s um, because of overhunting. So almost 800,000 black ducks were shot every year. They're not actually black, you can see they're more chocolatey brown. And when they're flying, you can look at their wings They're It's called silver lining. So their wings appear really bright when they're flying. And they don't have this lining of um, white feathers along their speculum that the mallard duck has. So that's something to look for too. They spend their winter on Long Island. And then when springtime rolls around, they're migrating back northward to breed. Um, on the edges of ponds, but these are some photos that were taken at the refuge and these are all males or females. What do you guys think? These are all males. Good job. And uh, the gadwall is another really cool duck that we'll see. I think they're really beautiful, even though their their feathers are very neutral. Their plumage is really neutral, but the male has um, these long brownish uh, feathers, but mostly gray. So that's why they get the nickname gray duck. Um, they are dabbling ducks. So you'll see their tail tip up and you can tell that it's a gadwall if it has that black rump. So you wanna look, that's a field ID, is the black rump and the white wing patch. These ducks are seasonably monogamous, which means that they'll pair up just for the season, but they'll make a long pair. So they'll stay together from November and through through the springtime. So um, the ducks that we're seeing now are, uh, they're paired up and they, they will be breeding through the spring. Um, even if you just see them dabbling, right? I don't even see his head. You can tell that this is a gadwall from the black rump and the white wing patch. Um, but I like a lot of our, some of the pictures that we've taken here at the refuge are things that you will see when you're out there birding. And it's sometimes it's hard to notice them among a flock of different birds because they're so plain. Um, their feathers are fairly plain. But this is a picture that you can see. There's lots of black ducks in the background, mallards and geese. Gadwalls are, are, we see them actually a lot here at the refuge. Um, I've seen them almost every day for the last couple of weeks. This was taken today too. So these pairs, um, this is a picture from today. These guys will be breeding through the spring. The, the green winged teals, and it's hard maybe to tell from this big picture, but they're um, much smaller than the mallard ducks and the gadwell. They, are, they have this buffy yellow tail. So you can see there's a little bit of yellow on their rump and the males have the green along their, their eyes, the stripe but um, their speculum in flight or sometimes the way they hold their wings is why they're called green wing teal. So you can see on the male and the female that uh, they have that beautiful green speculum. And the oldest green wing teal was 20 years old. Um, these guys will also, will just see them for the winter. And they, they on their beak, will, they'll eat um, and filter invertebrates through the water. So that's what they're feeding on. Uh, the blue winged teal is, this is one of my favorite birds. I think they're so beautiful. The male has this white crescent along his um, face. The female uh, is, looks very plain, but you can tell that it's a blue winged teal. If in flight, you see this kind of dusty blue patch. So you can see there, that's why they're called blue winged teal. Um, if you don't see that, you just see a female, you can kind of study the male's shape of their head and the shape of their bill. And that's how you can compare birds, especially if you only see a female, it can be kind of tricky. 
But um, these are also long distance migrants. So they will make a really long journey um, that can end in other countries as far as like Central South America. And conservation in those countries is really important because um, they can be vulnerable to chemicals that are still sprayed in other parts of the world. Um, the chemical DDT is banned in America, but is sometimes used in other countries. So that can affect birds like, like blue-winged teals and other migratory birds that are still visiting those countries and parts of the year. But these guys are the second most abundant duck in North America. Um, a larger species that we've seen here are the northern shovelers, and they have the same colors as the, as the mallard duck, but you can tell that their bill is much bigger. So they have a really long, thick bill that's around two and a half inches long. And on the inside of their bill, they have, it's called lamellae. I'll show you a picture of it, but it, um, they like to feed on invertebrates and that helps filter it out. But again, a, a lot of times you won't be seeing beautiful perfect pictures like this, right? This is what you'll kind of see. And then you'll get the idea, um, at least on a cloudy day, you know, this was taken at the refuge, but you can see the same colors in the same spots. Those are really important things to look for as well as the, the beak. But these are the lam lamellae, they, they help filter. And this is based on what these ducks are eating. Um, the American widgeon, the males have another, almost like the green winged teal, that stripe, but on the top they have white and that's something to look for too. So they have the nickname bald pate because it looks like they're bald. It's kind of like why the bald eagle got it because they have a white head. Um, at the bottom, this is an, a natural variation of the American widgeon called the storm widgeon. And it just has wider cheeks, but it's just different um, plumages based on genetics. Has anyone seen a storm widgeon? I'm really curious. If you have, I'd love to know because I've never seen one I'd, I would like to. Um, here's a widgeon at the refuge. And uh, this is one of the most elegant ducks, the northern pintail, it migrates at night and it's one of the first ducks to migrate because it likes to be in shallow wetlands. And because shallow water freezes up north faster than deeper water, they have to migrate. So they'll, they'll, um, fly at night. The longest nonstop migration for a northern pintail was 1800 miles. So they're um, amazing flyers. They can fly 48 miles per hour. And you can kind of tell comparing the, the shape of the male's head, the neck and um, the arch of their bill, comparing the female's head to the males, you can see they look a lot alike. This was at the refuge as well as this one. Um, this was from last year. And then another favorite is the, the wood duck. And um, wood ducks, you can sometimes see they'll migrate. They're not as long distance migrates. So sometimes we'll see them like as early as February here at the refuge. And um, the males are the, the most beautiful duck in North America. It's not just me saying that, but that is a common known fact. But these guys nest in cavities of trees. That's why they're called wood ducks. And they have claws at the edge of their webbed toes that help them climb and sit on, on trees. You can see um, some of these pictures taken at the refuge were right in front of the nature center. So they'll sit on rocks. Um, and they will usually use a cavity that's around two to six feet, sometimes higher in a tree. They'll lay their eggs inside of the tree or in a box. So if you live near water, you can actually put up a wood duck duck nest box and see if they'll move in. So this is a male that uh, was at the refuge. And can anyone find the female wood duck? This was um, in the springtime. She was in one of uh, the red maples. So she's right in the middle there. I think you can see my cursor, but um, she's right in the middle. And so sometimes when you're looking for ducks and geese, you might want to look up. They might be in the trees. Um, more often than not, they'll be in the water, but it was cool to see this female there. And this is a photo that was taken in Florida. So this is a, a screech owl nest box that you can see the screech owl on the left and then a, the wood duck is on the right. So sometimes wood ducks will just dump their eggs. They, it's called brood parasitism. So they'll go into a nest box and they'll just lay eggs. It could be a young bird who she, she wasn't ready to raise the eggs or um, for different reasons, there's some adaptations that for brood parasitism. 
But in any case, um, a photographer or the homeowner noticed this and the duck actually jumped out before, um, before the, the homeowner could help and ran into the water and probably found mom. So it's kind of kind of interesting. And then um, moving on, so those were most of our dabbling ducks that we'll see. Diving ducks are very different. They're feeding in different ways and usually spending their time in different habitats. Um, so sometimes you'll see more dabbling ducks or I'm sorry, diving ducks in um, deeper bodies of water with different food sources like mussels. They're diving for um, sometimes fish and crustaceans. They usually have their legs at the back to propel them um, into water, but sometimes that means that they can't actually walk on land. So if you ever see um, a, a duck that's maybe on an icy patch, it might have thought that it was water and landed and then can't can't actually walk. So sometimes they do need help. Um, but diving ducks um, that we'll see at the refuge include the ring neck duck. So this is actually a bad name for the duck because there is no ring on the neck. Um, what it's referring to is actually a ring of brown on the male that you really can't see unless it's perfect conditions. But the field ID to look for is the ring around the bill. So you can remember to look for the, the white ring around the ring neck duck's bill. Again, the female looks very similar to the male. Um, she has the same slope of the head, same slope of the forehead, but for the female, um, she has a white ring around the eye. So on the um, right-hand side, those are some ring neck ducks that we have seen at the refuge and they're diving. So sometimes you'll see them come up in a different spot. It's really fun to look for them. Um, and then the hooded merganser is another very common bird that we'll see from late October to maybe late February here at the refuge. They're pretty common in different freshwater bodies of, of water all across Long Island. And they're really fun to look at because they have really big personalities, I think. Um, they also make a funny noise. You can listen for, sometimes you'll hear it. It's kind of like a croaking noise I'll hear in the morning at the refuge. And it looks like they have a mohawk, but um, genetically they're actually in between golden eyes and other mergansers. They will be diving and eating fish and crawfish. This is a video um, that we took here at the refuge last December, I think it was. But so they'll dive down and they're looking for small fish, um, crustaceans, but in the video, I think, yeah, the female on the left-hand side pulls up a fish. Underwater, they actually have um, membranes that it's called a nictitating membrane, but basically it's like a third eyelid that covers their eye and acts like goggles. So uh, they can hunt underwater. Um, the common merganser is much larger. It is a top predator in the food chain. And that means that because it's at the top of the food chain, it can be really vulnerable to toxic metals that are found in the environment. Um, sometimes lead shot can, can um, hurt birds like this, even not because they're being shot, but because the lead goes into the water and when they're feeding on animals, um, it can affect them. But the common mergansers, um, we'll see them on the right hand side in this breeding plumage usually um, because the, the left hand side is breeding plumage, the right hand side is non breeding, so it's the eclipse plumage. Um, but you can tell underneath the chin there's this white patch, and that's how you can tell them apart from other mergansers, like the red breasted merganser is coming up. But this is a photo that was taken in Minnesota. Uh, this is a a common merganser with 50 ducklings. And scientists suspect that maybe these other ducklings were separated from the parents. And because ducks can't count, they don't know whose baby is who. Sometimes the babies will just follow their mom, they're imprinted, or they'll follow a species that's them. That's them. So uh, that's pretty amazing. And then the red-breasted merganser, usually you'll see them more in saltwater habitats. We've seen them here though. Um, and they have this shaggy mohawk of hair the males have. They have white around their neck. Um, but the female, it can be hard to tell from the common merganser, but you can see that the or doesn't have the white under its, its chin, really. So that's a field ID to look for. And then, whoops, 
So sometimes, again, in, in poor lighting, if you're far away from a bird, it's hard to tell. But um, some of those things, like even just you notice right away that it, it has this ring of white around its neck. So you can tell that it's a red-breasted merganser. And the reason why they get their name is that, that brownish red on their chest. So another thing to look for. And the ruddy duck is very is very petite duck, very cute, I think. Um, and they have this bright blue bill in the breeding season. Well, you see them, of course, again, it's not the breeding season. So we'll be looking for birds that tail that usually sticks up straight. Um, you'll see them more like this, the female or the non-breeding plumage. So they actually, this is a duck that feeds at night. Usually they're more active at night and they'll sleep during the daytime. Um, and uniquely, they don't make a pair bond or they don't make a breeding bond until they reach the breeding grounds. So they'll wait until they get there, um, unlike other ducks and geese. So this is a ruddy duck that was seen at the refuge. And again, just from even just the shape of the body, you know right away that it's a ruddy duck. Um, some predators include red-tailed hawks and great horned owls. And uh, another small, similar to the same size as the ruddy duck, is a bufflehead. Um, buffleheads, usually you'll see them in more saltwater habitats, but uh, occasionally we'll see them here at the refuge too, and they will have that um, non-breeding female plumage is this white kind of oval underneath their eye. They are divers and they're very small, so usually they disappear quickly. And those were some of the ducks and, and birds that we'll see at the refuge. These are some waterfowl that are wintering on Long Island, but the habitat is different. So we don't usually see these birds at the, the refuge on Old Ice Pond. Um, not that they can't be here, just they're just not as common. So sometimes I'll see records of scoff like on eBird and definitely a possibility, but the other birds really prefer to be in deeper water like the long-tailed duck, um, you'll see them on the Long Island Sound, sometimes in the ocean because they like to dive and they like to eat different foods. But all of these birds are, are birds that you can look for. It's really exciting. Um, and again, if you get a, a field guide of Eastern North American birds, they'll be in there. So very exciting. And these guys are coming all the way from the Arctic. They're, some of them are breeding up in the Arctic, like the eiders. So they have a long journey. It's pretty amazing to see them. And then there are some duck-like birds that will visit our area, uh, the pied-billed grebe. This um, grebe actually means in Latin that their feet are at their buttocks. So you'll see, you can even see the foot here. It's amazingly webbed toes, really cool looking foot, but we'll see them at the refuge here. They disappear under the water. They can just swim with their eyes level to the water. So they'll disappear really quickly and they're fairly small, but um, one of my favorite birds, not that I have to have favorites, but, and then uh, the common loon, you can see um, in the non-breeding plumage with all that white, they have this thick bill, really big bird uh, on bodies of water around Long Island. And they have very solid bones for diving. They will be hunting fish. Um, brants are another one. Brants are a, a really a salty goose. So they like to stay in the salt water um, on the sound or in the ocean or bays. And then one thing um, to look out for, not to overwhelm you, I hope I, this is not overwhelming, but there can be hybrid ducks, which means that they've crossed between different species. So um, a black duck mallard usually has like the body of a black duck and then this green from the mallard. So I've seen them at the refuge, but we had this really cool duck on the left-hand side. It was a mallard pintail. So it, right away, it kind of looks like a mallard, but then when you look closer, you can see that it has this white ring around its head and the, the pintail of the pintail. So um, kind of a deep dive into research if you find a confusing hybrid. Also, domestic ducks could accidentally get out of their owner's properties, or maybe they were released, so something to look for. And then uh, you might get so lucky as to see a very rare or sporadic visitor to North America. The, both of these ducks are from um, Europe. So the Eurasian widgeon, I think, looks kind of similar, and the gargany, um, is, it, I think, uh, looks different from birds that we see, but don't overlook um, some of these rarer birds. It could be possible. And, 
taking pictures is, is very handy too. And uh, of course, conservation should be at the, the forefront of, I think anytime we go out in nature, making sure that these animals can be around for generations to come. That's how the refuge got started. But um, I think it is important to so support organizations like that and, and to know that, um, to not take them for granted, actually. Ducks and geese were, um, in the 1930s, when the refuge got started, they were afraid that wild ducks would become extinct, kind of like the bison, so, um, or similar animals like that. So it is important to protect animals, even the ones that we take for granted now, um, because a lot can change. And, and, um, but I hope you enjoyed this program. I hope you learned something new. And I'd love it if you come to the refuge and look for ducks and geese. I'm always looking on eBird to see what people log. And I try to log on eBird too when I can. Um, but feel free to, to email any questions or you can ask them right now if you have any questions. I see a question from Susan. So um, Susan, definitely feel free to ask your question. I'm going to ask you to unmute. I think that that will work. Sorry about that. Uh, just wanted to ask you, I came in a minute or two late and you were talking about the um, membership. I had joined like way at the end of this last year. So do you, is it calendar year or is it um, just a year from when you sent in the donation? It is actually the calendar year. So it runs from okay. January 1st to December 31st. Okay. Yeah, I'll send thank you. And thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Let's see if there was any other questions. Yeah, thank you all for joining me today. Um, definitely one of my favorite topics to talk about. So if you ever think of a question about ducks or geese or um, see something at the refuge or on Long Island, feel free to, to email them. Um, I'll put my email in the, the group chat so that you'll have it. But I see a, a great question um, from Janet. She's seen loons on the Long Island Sound. How long do they stay in the wintertime? Um, that's a really good question. I've seen, I'm pretty sure I've seen a, lo a common loon on Long Island in like the early spring. Um, it could have been a young bird. Usually birds that are older will want to get to the breeding grounds first. So they have um, a longer amount of time and they can set up a territory. I'm pretty sure I saw a loon on Long Island in um, in April, but I'm they probably will stay um, breeding for most of the birds will start in like late April, maybe mid April, a little sooner than that. And then um, also, I, I didn't include it in this presentation, but um, there are different types of loons. Uh, so the common loon is probably the one that we see the most, but there's also the red-necked loon um, on, on Long Island Sound. Sometimes you can see them too, but um, a little harder to differentiate. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let me, I'm gonna finish typing in um, my email. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much. And we, we actually have some more programs coming up at the Refuge through January and February, but Light the Night will be um, a fun program that's here at the Refuge and we have some information on our website. But if you wanna learn more about the history of the Refuge, we have another virtual program coming up in, um, in February, it's on February 9th. So it's a free program about the history of the refuge and there will be a lot of duck pictures in there too. So if you wanna see some, some old pictures of ducks, which I love, you can sign up for that program. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Um, I'm so happy that you joined me tonight and, uh, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.